Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the uh, Institute. Uh, this morning, we will uh, continue the MPI session with the team at Argonne. So, Argonne, take it away, please. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Conju. I'm a postdoc uh, in the Mathematics and Computer Science Division here at Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, and today I will review um, the first of the um, MPI tutorial um, presentations. Uh, we have uh, two hours today. I will uh, introduce you to collective communication. And then uh, Jan Fei will take over for uh, remote memory access. And then I will uh, come in again and talk to you about uh, accelerators. And we also have a, a short hands-on section at the end of the tutorial. Right, so uh, collective and uh, non-blocking collective communications. So uh, collective communications have the characteristics that they are called by all the processes in a communicator. Um, they share similar syntax and semantic with the point-to-point -point operation that you have been introduced to yesterday during uh, the first part of the MPA tutorial. Uh, but have some uh, important differences. Uh, the most relevant is that collective operations have no tags argument, um, which imposes some restriction on the ordering of the collective operations that I will discuss in the next slide. And they also have uh, um, a stricter um, the type matching rules than point-to-point -point operations, as we will also see in the next slides. Uh, collective operation may also have or have not a synchronization effect on the calling processes. Um, and this is uh, relevant for uh, programmers uh, because uh, some implementation uh, may actually implement uh, um, some of the collective operation in a synchronization way in a synchronizing way. But what is important to know for the user is that um, they shouldn't rely on any specific um, synchronization side effect because the disease is um, um, implementation specific uh, uh, aspect. So if you write your application relying on some synchronization effect provided by some of the implementation and then you move your code to Another MPI implementation, you lose portability there. So in general, you should account for the fact that some of the collective may have synchronization side effects, but you shouldn't rely on any of uh, these. Uh, so there are three classes of collective operations. Um, the first is uh, synchronization operations. Uh, then there is uh, data movement, and uh, we also have collective computation. So the communication and the, compu and the computation is coordinated uh, among all the uh, group of uh, processes in the communicator. And the way uh, the communication is coordinated is not specified implement by the implementation, uh, is not specified by the standard, is left to the implementation. So the implementation can do some uh, smart optimization uh, to optimize the data movement and the computation. With uh, MPI standard version 3, uh, there was also um, addition for uh, non-blocking collective operations that allow uh, the programmer to overlap uh, part of the, communi the communication uh, with the computation in the program. So uh, I, to I told you that uh, there are some uh, differences between uh, uh, collective operation and point-to-point -point operation. The first, that um, collective operations have no argument. So in this slide, I have two examples of uh, collective operations. The first is the BCAST, which basically uh, distribute data from uh, one of the processes in the communicator called the root uh, to all the other processes in the communicator. The second one is MPI reduce that combines data from all the processes in the communicator uh, does uh, some uh, computation on the data and returns the result to one of the processes uh, in the communicator called the root process. As you can see from uh, these two uh, collective operations, they have no tag argument. This means that uh, uh, there is no tag matching 
and you have to issue, and this impacts basically the order in which you issue a collective operation. So collective operation should uh, be uh, called in the same order by all the processes in the communicator. Otherwise, you have uh, um, wrong behavior. And your application will, uh, will block. You will have a deadlock. Uh, the second aspect concerns uh, the uh, data type matching rules. Uh, so in uh, uh, the presentation yesterday, you have been introduced to point-to-point uh, -point operation. You, you have seen that, um, for example, in point-to-point -point operation, the sender and the receiver are allowed to use different uh, derived data types to uh, send data to each other. Um, the restriction is that uh, the basic type in the derived data type has to be the same. However, the amount of data can be different. So the receiver can expect to receive uh, a little bit more data than the sender is actually sending. And this is useful, for example, if you have to send um, a large uh, chunk of data in your program, you want to divide this uh, big uh, buffer into uh, multiple uh, sub-segments and send them one after the other. Of course, if the uh, chunk size that you choose is not multiple of your data size, you will end up with the last uh, segment that has lesser data than uh, the others. So to account for this uh, possibility, for this relaxation in the type matching rule, um, the MPI receive has this additional uh, status argument that is also used not only for, for this uh, particular aspect, but also for um, wildcard matching and so on. And uh, you can basically uh, discover or find out how much data you actually received from uh, the sender using by querying this MPI status object. As you can see in uh, these two uh, collective calls, there is no status object, which means that uh, the type matching rules are stricter than point to point. So in collective operations, pairwise, you have to send and receive the same amount of data. You cannot have uh, uh, different amounts of data because uh, this would complicate the implementation. You have, in some collective operations, you will have to have some array of status objects to query and so on and so forth. Um, so why are collective uh, operations important? Uh, these uh, are important because sometimes they match uh, naturally the semantic of uh, algorithms. You may have an algorithm that at the end requires, it, do, it does some distributed computation among the processes in your application, and then you have to reduce the result uh, into one process to, to print it or to write to a disk, uh, to, to a file or whatever. Uh, of course, you can, in the, in the case of Bcast, for example, you, you don't have to use uh, MPI Bcast, you can use just point-to-point -point, uh, operation that you already know to implement the same thing, but the uh, of course, the MPI implementation will, will do their best to optimize this type of uh, communication patterns. They will use different uh, optimization al at the algorithm algorithmic level. Uh, they will use topology knowledge to um, communicate data more efficiently. And ultimately, they will do a better job that you can do uh, by using point-to-point -point directly. So you are encouraged to use a collective operation uh, whenever uh, they fit uh, the, the semantic of your program. So I told you that there are three classes of uh, collective operation. Um, let's look at the first class, um, synchronization collective operations. Uh, so this is uh, the case of, uh, for example, MPI barrier. MPI barrier um, is a collective operation that takes a communicator and it basically synchronizes all the processes in the communicator, in that communicator. Uh, the function call blocks until all the processes in uh, the communicator uh, have, entered the, um, have entered the barrier. So if a process enters the barriers, it cannot leave the bar barrier until all the other processes have also entered the barrier. Um, so the, the barrier in, uh, in MPI is a very expensive uh, operation, not because of the implementation details, how the algorithm uh, works for the barrier, but because uh, typically in programs, uh, processes don't make progress at the same pace. They, there are some uh, loading balances, uh, 
um, noise uh, from the system and so on. So when you call the barrier, you are basically forcing all the processes to wait for the slowest process. And this is very expensive, of course. You are, you are forcing synchronization. So in, in general, you should try to avoid using barrier uh, as much as possible. One legitimate use of uh, barrier is when you want to, uh, you have some um, section of your code that you want to uh, measure how long it takes for uh, that section to be executed by your program, and you have some MPI W time surrounding your session, and you want to uh, guarantee that all the processes start the work at the same time. So in that case, you are allowed to use uh, an MPI barrier operation to make sure that this uh, requirement is met. Any questions so far? OK. All right, let's move to uh, collective data movement. Um, so in this slide, I have a pictorial representation. I've already told you about uh, broadcast in the previous slide. Um, so the, the broadcast operation basically takes the data from um, one of the processes, the root process in the communicator, and it replicates the data to all the other processes in the communicator. Um, this is just a pictorial representation to show you graphically how that happens. Um, there are also other collective operations. For example, we have scatter that takes the data from one of the processes, the root process in uh, the communicator and distributes uh, its data to all the rest of uh, all the processes in, uh, in the communicator. And gather, uh, that is basically the reverse operation, is uh, collecting the data from all the processes and aggregating, uh, gathering the data into only one process. Another example is uh, all gather, which is basically uh, a gather operation performed by, uh, in, in which the root is every uh, process in the communicator. And uh, all to all, which is a special type of uh, um, all gather in which uh, uh, the process sends data, different data to, um, to all the processes in the communicator. For collective computation, we have the uh, reduce operation um, that uh, basically, uh, as, as I told you in the, in the second slide of uh, the presentation, it combines the data from all the processes in the communicator and returns the result of uh, the operation to one of the processes, the root process. Scan is similar to uh, reduce. The difference being that uh, um, is a prefix reduce. This means that if uh, I have a process with index i and I issue a scan, that process i will get um, the reduction of all the processes from zero uh, up to i included. There is also an exclusive scan operation in which the difference is that you get uh, the process with index i uh, gets the result of uh, um, the, the, re the reduction of uh, all the processes from 0 to i minus 1. So there are many collective uh, uh, routines. Uh, we have seen uh, MPI reduce, uh, MPI gather. Uh, there are uh, also versions of this, as we saw, that um, involve uh, uh, return the result to all the processes. These are the uh, whole. Um, there are also uh, versions that use uh, um, that allow the user to specify uh, different sizes and uh, different vectors instead of just one vector. Uh, in the collective operation, these are um, suffixed by uh, the V. Uh, letter. Um, there is also some uh, additional version that allows to specify different data types for the different chunks in the uh, vector, uh, which is the uh, W. Um, and these uh, co collective uh, computing operations basically take um, built-in as well as user-defined uh, combiner functions. So there are, uh, this is a list of all the built-in functions that uh, MPI uh, reduce and all reduce, for example, can, uh, can take. 
um, there are operations for a uh, min max uh, some product and so on and so forth all these operations are both uh, associative and commutative so there are also uh, mechanisms that the MPI standard um, provides to allow the user to define its own uh, uh, combiner operations. For example, um, you can use MPI opcreate to um, register a user function with the MPI library. And this function, of course, has to have some uh, standard signature, like this user underscore fn, that basically means that you take an input vector, an input out vector, and a len and a data type, and the input output vector gets the result of uh, the input vector uh, combined with the input output vector. Um, the user have to be um, I have to tell uh, the, MPI, uh, the MPI library whether uh, the function is uh, uh, commutative or not. The function has also to, has also, uh, to be, um, has also have to be uh, associative. Uh, the restriction on um, associative and commutative means that the MPI implementation is allowed to do some optimization under the covers. For example, if you in, in this case, if you are uh, you have uh, four processes, zero, one, two, three, and each of these has some integer element, and you want to reduce uh, MPI reduce uh, these elements into process zero, for example, the MPI library can decide to build a binary tree and do basically associate different uh, elements together sum them and eventually you get the final result. Of course the MPI library if the operation is associative can also uh, for example take advantage of uh, network topology if process one and two for example are connected to the same switch uh, it's uh, more efficient for the MPI library to uh, do the uh, partial operation between these instead of process zero and one and uh, if the operation is also commutative, it means that if the process zero and three are connected to the same switch, they can also be uh, optimized to uh, communicate with each other. If the, the operation is not associative, you cannot do this. So the MPI implementation has some limitation and you have to tell what type of optimization it is allowed to uh, perform. So let's now move. Uh, before I move to non-blocking collectives, is there any question? OK. Let's move to non-blocking collectives then. So um, during uh, the presentation yesterday, you have been introduced to non-blocking communication, point-to-point uh, -point non blocking communication. Uh, and basically, um, you have seen that uh, this type of uh, communication uh, operations are very um, useful to avoid the deadlocks. Um, specifically, if you have blocking operations, for example, point-to-point -point send and receive, you have to make sure that all the MPI send and MPI receive uh, match between two processes. So you have some restriction on the order you call MPI send and MPI receive on different processes. With uh, non-blocking communication, you can issue them in any order and uh, then call MPI wait, and you will be sure that uh, your program uh, won't uh, block, uh, won't cause any deadlock. For collective communication, we have seen today that collective communication basically provides some optimized, predefined uh, routines that you can use to perform uh, um, some of uh, the data movement operation or uh, reduction operations. Um, Non-blocking collective communication combines uh, the uh, good things of both worlds, uh, non-blocking communication and collective communication. Um, it is uh, system and noise, um, uh, system noise imbalance resilient uh, because you can basically overlap uh, with collective non-blocking collective communication you can overlap the computation in your program with the communication in the PI, in the MPI library and they also have some semantical advantage uh, because uh, this most of many times fit uh, the computation model of uh, uh, programs <clears throat> 
So the semantic for uh, non-blocking collective communication is uh, pretty simple. Uh, the function returns uh, no matter what. Uh, there is um, no, no progress is guaranteed to be made uh, during um, after the function has been called. Uh, the semantic uh, is um, pretty simple. Uh, and the syntax is basically the same as uh, uh, blocking uh, communication with an additional request argument that is used to check uh, the progress on uh, the non-blocking operation using, for example, non-blocking uh, test or uh, blocking wait. So for um, collective operation, uh, non-blocking variants uh, are Exactly this, exactly the same signature as uh, the, the blocking variant with the additional MPI request argument. So as for uh, non-blocking communication, point-to-point uh, -point communication, uh, the function returns no matter what. There is no guarantee that progress, any progress is made. This is a quality of uh, implementation issue. So if your implementation has some background thread that can make progress asynchronously while uh, your program can do something else in, in the meantime, uh, then it's a good thing, but not all the implementation provide this uh, possibility. So after, uh, when, when you need to make sure that uh, uh, the collective operation, uh, the, the data is, um, has reached the destination, you have to issue a completion call like uh, wait or test. The completion can also happen out of order for different um, non-blocking uh, collective operations. So you can issue them in some, in some order and they may complete in a different order. So again, there are some restrictions. Since we have no tags, you still have to issue the non-blocking collective operation in the same order in all the processes of the communicator. Um, the send vector that you pass to uh, the collective operation cannot be touched uh, during the operation because uh, it's in, uh, in use. Um, unlike for point-to-point uh, -point communication, there is no MPI cancel support for uh, collect non-blocking collective operations. Reason being that uh, the semantic for MPI cancel in, in the case of uh, non-blocking collective communication is not well defined. And so it's basically uh, not supported. And uh, there is also no matching between uh, blocking and unblocking collective. So for point-to-point -point operation, you have seen that you can issue an MPI I send and use an MPI receive uh, to receive the data. So you can mix and match um, non-blocking communication with blocking communication in the case of point-to-point -point operation. This is not true for uh, collective operations because the MPI implementation might choose to uh, use different uh, algorithms to uh, implement the blocking and non-blocking versions. So you, you are not allowed to mix uh, the two because uh, you may end up with a deadlock. Um, so the advantages from the point of view of uh, the semantic for non-blocking collective communication are the same as for point-to-point -point communication. They enable a synchronous uh, progression of uh, um, your application. Uh, you can do software pipelining. You can over overlap the communication in the API in the MPI library with uh, the communication uh, with the computation in uh, in your program. You can decouple uh, the data transfer and synchronization. You have more, more noise resiliency um, because you're basically not blocking, for example, um, in the case of uh, collective synchronization for a process to catch up, but you can do other things in the meanwhile and the process maybe will uh, get up to speed with other processes that are faster. Um, I think I already touched on overlapping communicators, um, but basically here means that uh, um, when you have collective operation, we have seen that uh, all the collective operations have to be called in the same order by all the processes in the communicator, but there are situations in which you have uh, different communicators. And uh, if these uh, 
for example, two communicators that overlap, although you may issue the collective operations in uh, uh, the same order in all the processes with the two communicators, in some of these processes uh, are shared resources, you may still end up with a deadlock. Uh, so in, with uh, non-blocking collective operations, uh, you are uh, basically allowed to overlap, uh, uh, to have overlapping communicators and uh, issue um, different collective operations uh, on, on them uh, at the same time. So um, this is an example of a non-blocking barrier. So uh, when you uh, call an MPI-I barrier, the, there is no synchronization that happens when you call the barrier itself. The function returns immediately. The synchronization may happen, may happen or may not, um, asynchronously when you call MPI-test or MPI-wait. Uh, this allows, um, for example, to overlap the barrier latency uh, with uh, communication. As I said before, if you have uh, um, processes that are uh, progressing at, the, uh, at different speeds and you call an MPI barrier, a uh, synchronous uh, blocking barrier, um, all the processes that are faster... Oops, what happened? Okay. So all the processes that are faster than the slowest process have to wait for it to uh, catch up. With the uh, non-blocking barrier, all these processes can issue an MPI-I barrier, do some other stuff, and then eventually they can be notified collectively. Um, uh, they can uh, synchronize collectively uh, at the end using an MPI wait. So this is a summary of uh, what I've been discussing during this presentation. Uh, so non-blocking communication um, allow to overlap uh, and relax uh, synchronization. Uh, collective communication have uh, optimized algorithms to uh, improve data movement and uh, computation in, uh, in your program. Um, there is performance portability because uh, these uh, operations are optimized for uh, different platforms and uh, hopefully also transparent. You don't have to do too much uh, fine tuning for uh, getting good performance. Um, and they also can, uh, can also be composed. Um, is there any question so far? Okay, sounds good. Then I will leave the stage to Yanfei for the remote memory access presentation.